Hi, welcome to today's segment on competitive strategy. Um, I'm just going to start by uh, telling you that uh, there's actually a, a theory of strategy called industry recipes and what this says is that managers don't actually you know sit down at a desk and, and choose whatever strategy they're going to use for their organization what they do is they scan around the industry to their competitors and competitors would be those organizations that sell the same products and services to the same target market and they look at those that are very very successful and what they're doing and then they take those ideas from the best and then they integrate those into their organizations. So what you've got is this recipe for success that they've developed from the top people who are in the industry, the top companies in the industry. So what we're going to do before we go grocery shopping for corporate partners or strategic allies um, or networks of firms that we want to interact with, we need to develop our shopping list. All right, so there are many views of strategy. I've got a book here by Whittington, which clearly shows actually four broad um, perspectives of strategy that you can look at. For the purposes of this course, we're really just going to look at two different views of strategy. One is how a firm can achieve a sustained competitive advantage. And the second one is identifying the core competencies of the firm. So a sustained competitive advantage is a competitive advantage that another firm cannot copy. It's something that your firm can do that no other firm, no matter what, can duplicate. Okay, And the core competencies of the firm, the other main um, perspective that we'll look at, looks at what is it inside your firm that it does better than any other organization. And it might be two, three things that your organization does that it really excels at on a perpetual basis. Once we have a sense of strategy, then we'll look at how you use your a recipe to then go out and identify which organizations you should look at in terms of your strategic allies or your partners. Remembering, of course, that those organizations also have a shopping list. They also have a recipe for success and they're looking for a sport organization that they can work for that will help them compete against their competitors in their industry. Okay, so Andrews would tell us that strategy is the pattern of decisions made by organizational leaders over time. And that pattern of decisions is based upon the values and beliefs of organizational members. So very critically, uh, the, that pattern of decisions and the decisions that are made are not made in isolation from the broader context or broader environment of the organization. So when an organization is choosing a strategy, deciding what path they want to take, the customers that they're going to target, the geographic market they're going to look at, the nature of the products and services they're going to sell, they're going to look around and, and scan the environment and find out you know, what, what gaps there are in the environment but they're also going to look inside the organization at the values and beliefs of organizational members and the competencies of those members. So what is it that those people do very well? So once an organization has established its strategy, it then needs to attain the specific resources that it needs to achieve the strategy. So all organizations don't have everything that they need to make their own products and services. They have to access those from the external environment in some way, shape or form. Now they might just go out and buy them and exchange relationship, no problem, but they might have to establish a, a partnership or an alliance depending upon whether or not they're going to be reusing that, that uh, resource over and over again or the extent um, of availability of that resource in the broader market. So this is where we see the, the link that's so important in this class between strategy and alliances. 
So many of you may be familiar with Michael Porter, uh, who's highly recognized, very prolific, um, wrote competitive strategy back in the 80s. And this really defined strategy during that time period. And, and in, in the book, and hopefully you'll take a look at it um, if you haven't already, it really looks at strategy as very combative. Okay, so it's a militaristic view of dominating an industry. So looking at your suppliers, um, buyers, your new entrants, your, your substitutes uh, who might then compete with you um, to sell products and services and essentially figuring out barriers to entry. How do you quash those other organizations in the industry? But what we've seen in more than 90s on to 2000 is really a, an evolution of views of strategy uh, to be to assume a more collaborative way of looking at how industries operate. So instead of seeing these organizations as competitors, we've had this notion of collaborate to compete. So why not partner with another organization that, that um, may or may not be a direct competitor, combine resources, and then really tackle an industry um, to, to achieve that overall advantage that one organization alone could not achieve. So the first perspective of strategy that we're going to look at is the, the notion of a sustained competitive advantage. So this means attaining an advantage that no other organization can copy, right? So even if your organization does something really well, as I said, other organizations are scanning around the industry. They're looking at what you do well, and then they're gonna turn around and do the same thing. So how is it that an organization can do something that can't be replicated by other organizations around it? So in the readings, there's a great article by Amos et al. that looks at how sponsorship can be used by corporations to achieve a sustained competitive advantage. So definitely take a look at, at that as a reading. So I'll give you some of the information that Amos et al. and other scholars have shared about the types of resources that you can attain through a partnership or an alliance that can give you that sustained competitive advantage. So one is a very, very unique product. Another is superior data management, okay? Um, um, providing uh, an exclusive or very unique or very rare experience for your customers. Um, a process that excels all others. So one example of a process advantage um, that uh, really um, stands out um, was Fred Smith who founded Federal Express. Um, so hopefully you've all sent a package or received one by Fe FedEx at some particular point in your life. So what Fred Smith uh, understood was that if he had a superior process of moving packages through a hub and spoke mechanism using airplanes, trucks, trains, what have you, that he could compete against any other organization that was trying to ship packages. And that would have been mainly probably the US Postal Service, but certainly Canada Post uh, here in Canada. So what he did was develop this hub and spoke mechanism. And, and he promised customers that he would be able to deliver their package anywhere in the world within 24 hours. Now, it was a huge capital investment for him to go out and buy everything that was needed to develop this process of actually shipping all of these packages on a global basis, okay? And there's a great story about how he only had something like $50,000 left in the bank account. He couldn't even make his payroll. His whole company's gonna go under. He had this amazing vision. He's bought his planes. Um, so he went to Vegas with his last bit of money and gambled it and got enough to pay his payroll so he didn't have to uh, you know move into bankruptcy protection um, so that was that was the founding of FedEx and and it wasn't necessarily the customer experience it was that they could do it more quickly and more efficiently through this hub and spoke mechanism and I think Atlanta was that hub so all the packages would come into Atlanta and then be flown out from there Another source of sustained competitive advantage can be the knowledge or expertise 
of your employees. So to give an example, there are corporations that will recruit from universities and they will only take the top student in whichever field it is that they're looking for from only the top universities. So one example of an organization that does this is Gore and Associates. So Gore and Associates has over 5,500 patents worldwide. Some of you may know Gore and Associates because of Gore-Tex. So they, they manufactured Gore-Tex almost by accident. So Gore and Associates has over 45 million medical devices that are used worldwide. So this is their competitive advantage, hiring the top graduates here. It might be engineering, marketing, design, whatever it is that they need. So that's how they achieve this sustained way because they've captured that best talent. So an organization's culture can be another way of achieving a competitive advantage. And this is not only recruiting the top employees by keeping them there, by having a really great um, set of values and beliefs where you're honoring and valuing the individuals within your organization. And so there's a couple of stories. One of them is certainly from Nike um, and, and more so in the beginning of the, of the company when it was first founded. If you've ever read the book Swish, which you should, it's a fantastic book. It really goes through the, the founding years of Nike and it talks about how everybody came to work in, in t-shirts and jeans and, and they called their meetings butt faces and, and it was this whole energy around how can we do things better? How can we be the top? And of course they originally focused on um, you know track and field athletes, but how they evolved because it embraced this notion of informality but at the same time balancing that with this energy and innovation among the young people that work there. And I'll tell you a bit of a personal story. So um, when I was doing my master's degree at the University of Ottawa, it was the inaugural year of the Ottawa Senators. I'm not going to tell you that year, you can look it up because then I'll completely date myself. Um, but it was an exciting year at the Senators. Their main office was about an hour and a bit outside of downtown Ottawa where the university was. So I used to get on the bus and, and go out and they had rented uh, um, a huge room so there were no sort of separate offices. They had those dividers and they had a bunch of desks. So it was a very open concept. And most of the people who worked there were very young. They were like me and, and a lot of energy and dynamism and, and so much excitement, you know, that had, it was really in the whole city because it was the, the first season of bringing this legendary team, you know, back to the capital city. And I remember sitting at my desk in my little uh, cubicle and all of a sudden a golf ball would go under my feet and, and then another a football would go over my head and, and it was the sales guys and they were under huge amounts of pressure to sell and so it was a bit of this icebreaker climate to, to just make a sale and then get up and do something fun and do something crazy and something out of the ordinary and so we're just going to have a golf game around the office or we're going to have a football game around the office and the Bruce Firestone was the owner and he actually sat right behind me and he just sat there <laughs> it didn't bother him a bit that the staff were literally having so much fun in the office because he know that that knew that that sort of perpetuated this whole idea of teamwork which was what this inaugural franchise needed at the time your brand can also be used to achieve your competitive advantage. So infused in your brand um, are the values of your organization, the beliefs of its members, the standard of your product, the capacity and ability of the organization to stand behind that brand. So if that brand is innovation, if the brand is quality, if the brand is the best people, if the brand is a winning brand, whatever that brand stands for, that essentially is the essence of your organization that then can differentiate you from, other, from your competitors. 
Um, so when you sit back and think about what are the key global brands, right? Coca-Cola, Disney, there are top broadcasting brands, NBC, Fox, in terms of sports and be able to deliver the absolute best sport products. So Disney would be, of course, their um, network counterpart would be ABC that they own. So, you know, understanding those brands. And in sport, a brand also means that fan attachment to that brand. So fans are gonna buy your hats, your jerseys, your apparel, but they're also going to use that to sell the products and services of those corporate partners that you're aligned with. So this is how we see those brands of sports being leveraged by the corporations that, that sponsor them because those sponsors are actually purchasing access to that brand that they can then put on their stationery, they can put it on their signage, they can put your athletes on their television advertisements. So brand is also another key way that you can achieve a sustainable advantage that cannot be copied right so no one else can go ahead and use that Disney logo or use the five rings of the Olympic Games and of course those brands are very legally protected so how can you as a sport manager achieve a sustained competitive advantage it, it it's really comes down to the resources that you have within your organization so these are very scarce resources resources that are unique and not available to others, resources that can't be imitated by your competitors, that are very durable, they can't be traded, they're distinct or very peculiar, they're intangible, we talked about an organization's brand, or resources that can't be substituted. So as a sport manager, it will be your role to achieve a sustainable competitive advantage by attracting resources into your organization and or creating them, right? So you can hire the knowledgeable, most knowledgeable people from the top universities and or you could partner with another organization to create something that no other organization can duplicate. So you're looking for a resource that can't be imitated, that can't be duplicated, that's, in, that's inimitable, um, that is intangible. So that would be something like the brand that we talked about, that's durable, uh, that's sustainable over time. Um, that's very, very distinctive, so it's different from anything else that anybody else uh, is doing at that time. Um, and very clear, so resources that are scarce and unique obviously are going to be key to providing that sustainable competitive advantage. But the main point here is that your organization may not have those resources internal to the organization at the time and you may have to enter into a strategic alliance or a partnership in order to achieve access to that, um, that, that sustainable resource that can't be imitated or duplicated uh, or imitated by another organization. Okay, so what resources are difficult to imitate? One is reputation. So once your organization has achieved that competitive advantage because it has a, an incredible reputation, and that could be a reputation as a winning franchise or as a franchise that has great customer service, as a sport franchise uh, that um, maybe has amazing game day entertainment or the best sport broadcast, or you have amazing corporate partners that then enhance your game day or have uh, free giveaways at your games. Right? So these are all the types of things. So not only the resource itself, but the relationship that you have with other organizations also can be very difficult to imitate, especially today when many of these relationships are contractual. So if, if your sport organization is being sponsored by a credit card company, let's say Visa by way of example, that means that you can't turn around and, ha and, and have another relationship with American Express or MasterCard. So those contractual relationships guarantee access to your organization as a unique asset and it gives you access to something that say Visa or American Express might have that's also unique. It could be the reputation of your organization. 
Um, it could be tacit knowledge. Now tacit knowledge is knowledge that you can't get at university. You can't get it by reading a book. You can only gain tacit knowledge by actually doing or learning something on the job. So this means it's a very unique source of innovation. And Earlier we talked about corporate culture. So how do you develop a corporate culture in your organization where people are developing new ideas that can't be replicated? Okay, so people are, are whether it's um, by mutual exchange, by dynamic innovation, by research and development, by clearly in sport data analytics and how you're doing those data analytics. Who's doing that? Maybe there are new ways of collecting that data or analyzing that data that people in your organization are doing that nobody else is doing and, and that's your source of advantage because you're not going to share it with anybody else, right? That's going to be unique for you and then you can then, you know, attract other organizations. You're not going to give them that information but certainly they'll want to come and be your partner. Um, technology, research and development, certainly all of these are ways that your organization can develop these resources and establish your organization as very unique within the industry. So I think that that wraps up our discussion of sustained competitive advantage. Um, so certainly there are going to be some examples on Sakai, uh, some uh, videos that you can watch, some TED Talks. So make sure that you take advantage of, of those other resources to enhance your understanding because this is a critical uh, point when we look at moving forward in terms of uh, the other types of relationships that we'll look at. Okay, so we looked at strategic competitive advantage and how that can be a sustained competitive advantage. Now we're going to switch over and look at a second perspective on strategy. And this one looks at the core competencies of the firm. So the core competencies of the firm are the fundamental knowledge of the firm that sets it above for its competitors within its, its uh, marketplace. And so the fundamental knowledge of the firm um, is really quite an abstract term, but what we're really looking for here are our tacit knowledge. So that's knowledge that people within your organization have that they've learned on the job that you can't read a book or follow a uh, you know learn something at university this is this is you know why uh, going on your internships is so important it's it's um, specific knowledge to the organization that the people have learned by working within that organization by being part of innovative teams within that organization so it's really that experience that they've gained um, in the area of innovation creating new practices new ways of doing things new it could be a new set of value chains for your partners so it reaches into virtually every area of the organization what's important to remember um, about core competencies is that each organization really has between three and five okay so these and, and the reason why they're so limited, and actually many theorists really argue that that would be closer to three core competencies, is because once you identify the core competencies of your firm, what you do better than anyone else, means that you are only going to focus on those in terms of resource investment, hiring new people that are going to uh, further add to those core competencies that you already have in the organization. And again, these competencies then serve as a means for innovation with the, in the organization, and not just any information, but unique information. Information that your competitors wouldn't necessarily have because it's derived by key people who are your uh, resources within the context of the organization. So these competencies can be dynamic routines that are integrated within the organization. And what's important here is that um, often organizations are segmented into functional areas. So in sport, um, it might be the coaching area, it might be the front office, marketing, uh, customer service, etc. When we look at core competencies, it's that higher level knowledge or ability to use innovation that cuts across 
across these functional areas. So it's not distinctive to just one element of the organization. And that's what's key here. So it might be an overriding philosophy of the organization that pushes people to be more innovative. So instead of just, you know, taking a look at what you've learned on customer service, it's saying, what more can you do? How, or how can we integrate what we know about our athletes and then expand that into our community programs to help local sport organizations? So that might be um, an example of how you've taken a core competency, a unique uh, set of ideas around coach training, and then you're extending that into the foundation side of your organization to help local hockey teams. So, and then that links back into your customer service, to the foundation side, to organizational giving that you then link back to your marketing, right? So in your marketing and promotions and what your the messages that you're giving about your organization aren't just that you have this really amazing hockey team with fantastic coaching, but that you're using these ideas to benefit the community. So this is what we mean by not being isolated to functional areas of the organization, but taking this tacit knowledge that you have and extending it to different functional areas. So, so it really is this overriding philosophy of the organization. And it's dynamic. It's always shifting and changing as, of course, these people in your organization are learning new things, adopting new practices. They're being creative in, in the ways that they're maybe linking up with local community sport organizations, asking what their issues are, and then seeing how the knowledge of your organization might be able to help them. So what's key to really leveraging these competencies is you need managers who understand fundamentally that you're no longer operating in a functional area of the organization, that this overriding idea of new knowledge, infusing this philosophy throughout the organization um, is then uh, adopted throughout the organization. So you need managers who are going to be flexible. So when someone comes to them from, uh, you know, maybe um, customer service and says, gee, we're looking at how you're managing our athlete protocols. We're wondering if we can adopt some of these ideas for our business customers. And then you need a manager that's going to say, you know, what do you think that would look like, right? Tell me a little bit more about this. Explore that in greater depth. And, and, and then maybe bring in people from the, the training side, the, the sport side of the organization and see what, what ideas can be adopted. So you need managers who are open and flexible um, and see that the bro their broader role is the transfer of this tacit knowledge and ideas across the organization rather than just operating marketing per se, right, or, 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 you know, customer service per se, or business clients per se, or sales per se, seeing that all of these areas of the organization are really infused in terms of this overriding idea of we're enhancing the experience of every single person that touches or comes in contact with our organization. The questions that you see on screen now are a few of the questions that you might ask when you're trying to either uncover the core competencies of your firm and or leverage them. We've looked at the core competencies of the firm and strategic competitive advantage. And I've sort of treated them as two distinct, distinct views of, of strategy within the context of this presentation. However, both lead to a sustained competitive advantage. So both the sustained competitive advantage and core competencies enable you to undertake uh, strategies within the context of your competitive environment that enable you to, com to complete um, activities that provide you with that um, ability to undertake efforts that can't be replicated by others.